Okay, so let's start. Um, so I'm happy to to welcome uh, Federico Bonetto here, and uh, I think I I don't know for most of you I probably don't have to introduce him. I mean he's an I think an old friend of all of us for for a long time. So um, Frede uh, Federico uh, studied uh, at Scuola Normale in Pisa. The, of, afterwards, he made his uh, PhD in in Roma. Con, uh, Giovanni Galavotti, and then he started his tours through the world, and now he's far away in, in, in Georgia Tech, Atlanta, and uh, today he will tell us something about some results on a simple model of kinetic theory. Welcome. Okay, um, thank you, and so let me start. So I'd, <clears throat> this is the, the plan, and since I've been the beginning of the talk, I think, will be a little introductory. I hope I'm not going to bore anybody. Then introduce what is the, the CATS model and classical results on this uh, model. And then some recent and less recent re work we have done with uh, several people in, in Atlanta. And having time, a little idea or outlook on what I would like to do later going on. So just for uh, to start as simple as possible, What's kinetic theory and or in general that I see as a branch of statistical mechanics is that you want to understand how to describe the macroscopic behavior of a gas. You think of the here in his room and uh, somewhere they told you that this is formed by atom that move zip around, collide and make a lot of mess. So the idea is that the model for a gas is a large, very large, we'll see in a moment number of particle m in a volume v and particle are hard sphere or with a very small radius r we will neglect in this talk any question about uh, quantum mechanics meaning we will think to be at uh, temp at this temperature quantum mechanics is not very relevant or at least we think is not relevant and uh, collision are elastic this is another great simplification because molecules in, in their own are extremely complex system that these will not enter minimally. And then one of the main ingredients is that there is something called a temperature that is essentially proportional to the average kinetic energy. And temperature will enter everywhere. So, and just to have an idea of what these numbers are, this is a cubic meter of oxygen at uh, zero Kelvin, 200, zero centigrade, 273 Kelvin, at one bar, at ambient temp. And then the number of molecules for an, in a cubic meter is 10 to the 25, roughly. So when I said a lot, is a lot. The radius is roughly 10 to the minus 10 meter. How this kinetic radius is defined, I'm not entering it, but it's the one that makes sense for the following. So you have an occupied volume of 10 to the minus four, five, 10 to the minus four, meaning that the vast majority of the space in his room is empty. There is no actual atom. The average speed is, as you can see, roughly 500 kilometers an hour, and I mean 1.150 meters a second. The mean free path between, meaning the, 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 the space a particle travel between two collision is roughly 10 to the minus seven meter, and the time between two collision is 10 to the minus five seconds. This is, is really a big number. And, but just to have an idea of what is going on, a very largely heavily simplified idea that what's going on is, I have here on the, on the left panel, you see there are a thousand particles, thousand particles whose position is random selected in half of the container that contain them, that is the square. It's two dimensional because of plotting necessity. And both the X and the Y velocity are selected uniformly in Z in minus one one independent from each particle. So it's for whatever you know, this is how, as far as from equilibrium as I could think about. So it's completely and, uh, and if you start your, uh, your simulation, this is what uh, you see. And 
this is the data. We can stop it here. And as you can see, uh, pretty fast, the particles are uniformly distributed in space. And on the velocity side, you see appearing a normal distribution, a Gaussian, a Maxwellian, whatever you want to call it, depending what's your background. And it took either the whole simulation is less than a thousand, and then 10,000 collisions. So there are 10 collisions per particle. It's, it happened very fast. And you get, and if you look carefully, you will see that at the beginning when the gas expands, the temperature go down and then go up again because there is the coherent motion of expansion. And already at this level, you can see a lot of freaky stuff uh, going on. And in a sense, this is what the whole question is about. Why is this going on? What is going on in here? What's happening? How we describe? And clearly from here, you can then go on to much more complex. But already at this level, this is an interesting question. Why this system? This is what we will intuitively call equilibrium. And why is the system going to equilibrium? And then what are non-equilibrium options? Sorry. And uh, what are non-equilibrium state? How you describe? So, but this is just to have a beginning idea. And I just have to put a quote that I slightly cheated. This is the, the right panel is not actually the, the histogram, but the histogram smoothed in time for few collision. It's not to clear the noise, but just to, okay. So this is the, the, the basic of what we is all this about. And just to see how is the simulation done? What is the dynamic? The whole system is extremely simple. You have a bunch of particles here. I have only, I think 20 with their velocity. And what you do, you evolve them till two particles collide. These two, the first collision that happened. Then you do the collision and then you keep on going. And you keep over, over and over. So from the, 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 that simulation from a conceptual point of view is a triviality, clearly, Nowadays, you can, there are a code that can simulate up to a million of particles. There, you have to be very smart to do it. But the basic idea is absolutely simple. And the fundamental thing is that both, uh, even if you think it numerically, the most difficult thing is computing the next collision. And that's also analytical. Tracking the collision is the big deal in the business. And so we will see in a moment what is the idea to escape that. But Tracking the collision and computing the effect of the collision is the big problem. And both in theory, then from a numerical point of view. Okay, so just uh, to start with, and uh, <clears throat> just a quotation that I always love from uh, Fourier, one, one of the founder of uh, thermodynamics that tell us that heat like gravity penetrate every substance of the universe. It's why right, occupy all part of space. The object of our work is, set, is to set forth the mathematical law which these elements obey. The theory of heat will hereafter form one of the most important branches of general physics. And this we can all agree, I mean, this is what we're doing. And, but he goes on saying, but whatever may be the range of mechanical theory, they do not apply to the effect of heat. These make up a special order of phenomena which cannot be explained by the principle of motion and equilibrium. And by motion equilibria, he means classical mechanics, Newton. So the main problem of the beginning of this talk and of the field is to prove that Fourier was wrong. Actually, we can do it, hopefully. Okay, so, but the question that this can be done, now you can follow the, 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 the 19th century evolution of physics is a big discussion on the question whether you can reduce thermodynamics to the microscopic physics and the real things why a big improvement came there is because at some point the things called the steam engine was invented. Now you have that thermodynamic can move things. So better we understand this. Okay, so now just to have a still a small of physical introduction, I quoted the mean free time of the particle. That's actually is not an independent number and is as I said, the, the collision are what drive the system. So the number of collision in a unit time is what really is the natural time scale. Well, it's the inverse of the natural time scale you want to consider because it's the number of collision 
If there is no collision, there is no equilibration. That's more or less trivial. So you can, a, a brief computation tells you that if you have an average velocity V bar, you have D is twice the radius, the diameter of the particle, then a particle moving in a time T will swipe the gray cylinder in the picture. And the number of collision it, it will have is just given by the number of particles you find that cylinder. So the density is, is that the, vo the volume of the cylinder times the density. And so you get a pretty simple number that is given there. On top, V bar is linked to the temperature. Uh, again, caveat, there is a little cheating. This number is not correct because the other particle moved. There is a square root of two correction if you want to take into account the movement of the other particle. But I, I'm just interested in the limit. So that doesn't make any difference. So there is a natural thing to think to when you want to say what is the natural limit for the system, like the thermodynamic limit. In this case, is what is called the Grad Boltzmann limit. And the idea is that you send the radius of the particle to zero and the number of particles to infinity, keeping the volume fixed in such a way, the number of collision a particle suffer in a second in average is constant. And that is the, the inverse of the number is called the mean free time. So that is the natural time scale and it's the only time scale that will be left in the model we, we will go seeing. That is in 1956, Mark Katz, I'm not sure whether it's 55, 56. The, the, I, I had to check because in, in, a, in a talk by Michael Lost recently, he said 55. But okay, it doesn't make much of a difference. The, the Mark Katz introduced the model. And the idea is really to try to have a model that is complex enough to retain some interesting behavior, but simple enough that you can do some math. The, the, the realistic model in the collision is extremely difficult. And, I would say that still nowadays very little is known. And so the idea is that you take M particle in one, two or three dimension, we will mostly consider one for simplicity of notation. And then you think that they are uniformly distributed in space. And instead of having deterministic collision, you say in every interval DT, I have a probability lambda M DT of having that a collision take place. If, you're, if you want to say mathematically precise, this is a Poisson process of intensity lambda hem. But I prefer to think that in every DT, you flip a coin that has lambda hem DT possibility of giving you head. If it's head, you decide, okay, there is a collision. If there is a collision, you choose two particles at random, uniformly, you pick a pair of particles. And, and what you do, you randomly, Re, uh, distribute energy and momentum in such a way that the energy and the momentum are conserved. When this, where the second one, momentum, clearly require dimension to be greater than one. If you are in one dimension, you cannot preserve both. And, uh, and as I said, uh, and uh, lambda m, we go back to the previous slide. What is lambda m? I fix lambda m in such a way that the average time between two collision or a given particle is independent of m. Exactly what we were saying before. This gives me lambda m is equal lambda over m minus one because every particle has probability of colliding with m minus one other. Actually, in the in cats, uh, we will see he choose lambda over m as the scale. It really doesn't make any difference asymptotically. It's just from now on. I will use lambda over m to keep contact with the classical uh, work. And what are the main simplification we have introduced here is that collision are stochastic and independent from the position and velocity of the particle. Clearly, the energy and momentum are distributed randomly. And these are the two simplifications that are evident to start. There is another one that is very important is that the collision rates does not depend on velocity. If you are in a realistic gas, you expect that a very fast particle will collide more than a very slow one. And this has been wiped out. And uh, this indeed, there is some attempt by Nuho and Michele and by Loss and Carlin to extend some of the results I will talk about to the case 
where there is dependence on the velocity, a realistic, but I will not enter in, in, in here. And sometimes this situation is called a Maxwellian molecule for a reason. I may use this expression, that means collision rate independent of the velocity. The reason why is too long to, to enter. So how does the evolution work of a system like this? Now, this is a probabilistic system. Uh, the system is not completely absurd in the sense that a very similar structure is used as what is called a direct Monte Carlo simulation, in which you consider on top of this random collision, then you do two things. You have particles colliding randomly in boxes, and then you let them stream with their velocity for, uh, for some time. Then you re-put them in boxes and do the things. And this is actually used to simulate the Boltzmann equation. A friend that works at Los Alamos told me that that's how they did the simulation for the re-entering of the shuttle into the atmosphere. That sounds very nice. I don't know if it's true, but it surely is a good idea. And, uh, and so the idea of having random collision and maybe streaming, we see also at the hand, it's, it's a simplification, but it's not a complete absurd. And, but to say as simple as possible, I will assume from now on that space is one dimensional. So the state of the system is a probability distribution. From our, since I said I take, keep particle at random, I completely forget the position. This is relevant for, uh, for, for the evolution of the system. So I only have the velocity and I have a probability distribution on the velocity. Meaning, <clears throat> and we assume that our particles are identical. And so we take it as an invariant under permutation of its algorithm. This is always assumed from now on without saying. And uh, if, <coughs> if, if uh, particle one and particle two collide, what do I do? I, the thing I can use the, post 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 si, si. the collision rule is very simple. It's like it's very difficult. I have two velocities. Let's put it like this. This is V1 and this is V2. I take the circle. Push two. Well, okay, it sounds quite as fancy as that it's in a circle. And, and then just choose an angle theta and rotate, and these are V1 prime and V2 prime. So the, the, the idea is just you apply a rotation, and in this way is the simplest way to preserve the, the, the kinetic energy. And clearly you cannot preserve momentum as, as we said. So the, the, the situation is that I start from V1, V2 and I go up to V1 prime, V2 prime that is given by the formula. That means that if I want to come out with velocity uh, V1 prime and V2 prime, I should start with V1 and V2 that are given by the inverse. That is a rotation. So the inverse is that you just change sign to the sign, say sign to the sign. And this is why you always see Katz model if you ever know with the minus there. And then to say, what is the effect of a collision? I should integrate over all the initial state that will bring me to the final state I want with the probability of having that collision, that uh, transition. But here I take uniformity. Uh, you can redo most, I think almost everything what I will say with a probability distribution of a theta with minor condition, but it doesn't really add anything too interesting. And then you, we said that uh, <clears throat> if I pick, the idea of picking a pair of particle at random, it just means that I take the average over all the possible uh, pair of collision. And I will always take, uh, uh, only consider I less than J. And so you have one over N choose two uh, pair. And then the, my rule before tell me that the number of collision in a time T is a Poissonian with intensity lambda N. So the number, the probability of having K collision in a time T is given by that number, that Poissonian uh, weight. And so now I can say that that fact of uh, the, all the collision in time is given by this sum. I have to sum over all the fact of all possible number of collision time the probability that I had that number of collision. If you resum that, that series and everything here is bounded or operator of bounded, so everything till now make perfectly sense 
uh, you get that the, the, the evolution is given by the exponential of a generator. And the generator is the one written uh, underneath. There are other ways to derive this formula of the generator, but this is the one I like more. Uh, and so you have to study the evolution generated by this generator. That means this differential equation. What you're looking at is a solution of this differential equation and F dot. And uh, it's clear that these preserve kinetic energy. So if I fix, if I have a distribution on the, the, the sphere with a given radius, we'll stay there. I write, I write the radius in that form because it's also clear that the evolution does not depend on the radius. It's just a very simple. So at the end, you can fix yourself to e equal one up and you take it in square root of n. And, uh, and then the, 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 the uniform distribution is the only equilibrium state. This is the microcanonical ensemble for physical term. And every initial distribution evolves toward the uniform distribution. Question is, if you ever saw the, 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 the effect of projecting a uniform distribution on a sphere in i dimension on one coordinate, as you know, you get a normal a Gaussian. That is exactly why we get the Gaussian at the beginning in, in, the, in the movie. Now, the classical result is that these operator LS is self adjoint in L2. That's uh, easy to see. And you can exactly compute the gap. That's a work by, that was conjectured by Katz, was proved to be uniform in M by Jean Bresse, and then Loss and Carl and computed the exact value. That is the one given there. And the problem with the L2 norm is that it's not a very good norm. If, if you think of your state to be a, almost a product, I, here I write it as a product. There are no product state on the sphere. So this is more heuristic. But here I have something that is almost a product. I have two states that are almost a product. Even if the single factor are very close, the two states are very far away. You know. The distance is huge. So even if the distance is order C to the M, even if you go to, to equilibrium uniformly in time, you start so far away that is in general not that interesting. But a more interesting quantity is the entropy, or I should say the relative entropy, because um, I, I will call it entropy from time to time, but it's wrong. This has the wrong sign. So physicists will complain about this. But with respect to the uniform distribution, this is the, the entropy. Standard uh, convexity argument tells you that the entropy is positive, is zero only if F is the uniform distribution, and that the derivative of the entropy decreases. It's, it's less or equal than zero. And moreover, if you have a product state, the entropy is order M. That is not order one like you would like, but it's still better than order C to the M. And for the Katz model, the, the, the uh, one Cherchignani conjecture that in the realistic system, that the entropy go down exponentially in time. What one can prove is that that's true, but with a constant that is equal to one over, that is order one over M. And so not uniform. And that this is essentially a sharp bump. That's work by Einav. It tells you that essentially, one over M is the sharp bound for the derivative of the, for the entropy, what is called the entropy production. Then one of the idea is that you have an initial, you may have an initial slow decay of entropy, but then it's always peak up and then go down exponentially. This is what people hope, but it's more dreams than any mathematical reality. Okay, so this was the, the, the so-called classical result. This is all, uh, then what we did, you started being, okay, I want to put some external influence. So I want to attach a thermostat to this system. What does it mean that at the, that nearby my system, I have my system that is kind of small with my particle and there is psi here, a huge system with infinity many particles that are initially at a given temperature, uh, T1 over beta. And from time to time, a particle in the system and the particle in the thermostat collide. 
And when the part and when this collides, the particle in the thermostat disappear at infinity, never to appear again. Or you may simply think that the thermostat is so big that it will never actually collide again. And so what you do is say, okay, I get a new particle. So my new distribution for the system is the initial f of v time the, the Maxwellian distribution for the particle. The particle and the, the outgoing velocity are given by the same formula as before. And since the particle disappear, I need to average over W. And so I get this formula for my thermostat. And we're, again, gamma, beta, V, I wrote shorthand for the Maxwellian. And from now on, if they appear, I will assume that the temperature is one over two pi. It's that again, it's just a, it doesn't make any difference. It's just that I avoid the normalization in front of the Maxwellian that is always annoying and I forget it most of the time. So it's, that's the situation. And now I have this evolution. I have my uh, system plus a, a thermostat that tend to bring it to temperature one over beta. And what can you prove here is that the, the, the Maxwellian at temperature beta is, is the unique sta uh, steady state. The annoying thing is that the new operator is not self-adjoint on the standard L2. So you just write it as a, your state as a deviation from the steady state, from the equilibrium state. And in this case, you get a self-adjoint operator in the new Hilbert space given by a product weighted by the, the Maxwellian. And with this situation, you can prove that the, the that L is self-adjoint, that H, that one in this case, uh, the Maxwellian is a unique steady state, and you can compute the first gap that is given by the interaction with the thermostat. Here, when you have a thermostat, approach to equilibrium is completely dominated by the, the thermostat. And then you can add a second, you can or even compute the second gap in which you see the a contribution from the evolution. And, uh, and on the other side, you can also look at the relative entropy with respect to the Maxwellian. And these, uh, uh, in this case, again, you can show that the relative entropy goes to zero exponential in the sense that the entropy of the evolution is bounded by an exponential with mu over two, and mu over two is sharp. You cannot get any better. You can show it easily that uh, that's the best thing you can do. And before going these, I wanted to add a word in, 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 I, on, on the whiteboard. In, I, I described this system with an infinite reservoir. What you can do that is also interesting is to ask, okay, suppose I take this system, I have n particle here, I have n particle here. And so my reservoir is a real other cat system, very big. And, uh, and the collision and the old thing is I have cat's collision here, the cat standard collision process here, and then collision between the small system and the large reservoir. And I ask myself if N is much greater than M, does this approximate a real thermostat and how long in time? And the, the, the things that you can prove that actually, yes, you can approximate the, 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 the behavior of this system compared with the behavior with the infinite system uh, described here, they are uniformly close and you can prove it, they are uniformly close in L2 with an error of the order m over square root of n. So you need to have n much larger than m. If you use what is normally called the GTW method, that is a Fourier-based method that I can write down, meaning if you have two function, f of v and uh, f1, and F2 of uh, V that are probability with a zero mean, probability distribution with zero mean, 
I take f hat of k, one is the Fourier transform. of f, one and d, and similar for f2, and then I took the state, the soup of the modules of f1 hat of k minus f2 hat of k over k square. And these I call it the d2 distance between f1 and f2. These works because these both computed in zero are zero. So there is the start. And then since they are probability, no, sorry, are one, so the difference is zero, then I have assumed that uh, their average is zero. So the first derivative, I, I just need to assume that they have the same average. But uh, the, since this is the average moment, uh, velocity of the system is natural to take the velocity in the center of mass to be zero. So these start from the A square. So this is in general is well defined. Clearly you can define a D alpha with putting other alpha here less than two, it, it, but this is the natural one. And this is a, a natural metric for, for the, the CAT system. It behaves very well, essentially because the Fourier series, the Fourier transform commute with rotations. So that uh, works very well. And in these, you can find that the two system Oh, and on top, this is a very nice metric because it's completely uh, intensive. The difference between a, a two product is equal to the distance between the, the individual factor. So that uh, is very nice from that point. And here you get that you stay close with an error that is M over N, uniform in time. These are both uniform in time. So you can actually prove that this thermostat can be actually be represented faithfully by a law in the interaction with a large system. What is missing here, we have some partial result, is uh, entropy. The, the, old is the, the technique we have don't work well with, the, with entropy. We tried, we have something we can show that the entropy go down exponentially, that the part of the average entropy in the system and that's how, several other things, but not this uniform approximation in, in entropy. And okay, so this is about the, and I don't know when I started, so when I should stop. Okay, good, so I have time. So now this is what one can say about what I call the canonical or a Maxwellian thermostat. I like to call it canonical because the equilibrium state is the canonical uh, distribution. So what about if I have a, a grand canonical thermostat? So in the idea that instead of having particles that collide, I have the system can exchange particles with the reservoirs. Again, the situation is like here, but instead of having the, the, the particles that collide with the thermostat, from time to time, a particle jumps in, and from time to time, a particle from inside the system jumps out and leaves the system. And clearly the, the rate of it. Sorry, Federico, can you repeat the question for oh, people? The question online? is, is there a relation between the Wasserstein metric and the TSD2 metrics? I don't think it's direct. They are both, both related. So you, you can find a lot of inequality between the two, but at this level, okay? So, I can enter more, but the, the, yeah, it, a lot of results are based also, you can do a lot of things also with the vastest time metrics. But that's more, if I have time with, with the propagation of chaos is often done with vastest time uh, uh, kind of distances. And, okay. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> now, this is this large reservoir and I have particles going in uh, and out of the system. And what is the idea? More precisely, I say that in, <clears throat> in every interval dt, each particle in the system has a probability rho dt to jump out. And with probability mu dt, one particle jump from the reservoir into the system, again, in a time interval dt. 
again, these are Poissonian process, but I can define it uh, like this. And then, <clears throat> and the reservoir is infinite, so no particle jumps, jumps in more than once. If, if it jumps out, disappear forever. And uh, again, <clears throat> when the particle enters the system, it has a velocity v randomly chosen according to the Maxwellian at temperature t. And I still take uh, t equal one over two pi to simplify notation. And to physically, this means that again, that the, the reservoir at temperature t one over two pi and the chemical potential of the reservoir is chi is two pi minus one log of rho over mu. That is, we'll see in a moment why this is what comes out. And clearly now, the state of the system is no more a distribution. Is it, the number of particles is, is very. So your state is a, a distribution on the union of all possible number of particles, where F0 is the state where there is no particle and uh, R0, and F0 is the probability that there is no particle in the system. And so I can discuss that so I, I have two generator for operator to describe my evolution. One is the in operator, which I just mean that I add, <coughs> sorry, the out operator. That I just means that I take one particle, this jumps out, so I just integrate over it. And at every level, I just have to do it. And each particle has the same probability of jumping out. So this is order n, this, this, this term. And then instead the in operator, I just take and add a particle, the, the front term e to the minus pi vi square is the particle. And here the sum in front is just to maintain uh, the invariance by permutation. So you can put it anywhere, but so this term is order one. And, and so you can so define the thermostat in this form, where again, you have the gain term are given by the two operator and the E and N are the loss term for the evolution. And N is just the average number of particles in the system to normalize the situation. On the other side, you wanna put for the collision and the collision operator here, remember the initial discussion, the probability that two particles collide given the, here the parameter is no more the number of particles. The parameter that you wanna take as to say dilute or not is the average number of particles in the system. Because here the system can have infinitely many particles. And the given two particles in the system, their probability of colliding in a given time does not depend on how many particles are there in the system. It's fixed. Again, assuming that the system is dilute, so that they can, there is no interacting uh, or constrained by other particles. So that the, there is no renormalization in front of the cat's term. The collision are just, so in particular, you have a term or the first term in the, in the generator is order one, the second is order n, and the third, the collision is order n squared. So this operator is badly unbounded, differently from what we had before. But these now, what I wanna study is the evolution generated by this things here. What is the equilibrium, how it converged to equilibrium and all what we did before for this new guy here. And clearly, as I said, the, the, the several term do not commute and are unbounded. So the first things that you have to show is that this generates something uh, meaningful as an evolution. And it does it, you, you just use a standard, uh, Duhamel expansion for the dynamics, and you can prove that all the property you want are preserved. And essentially, proving that exists is you can do it shorter, but essentially, you can represent the evolution as an integral on the trajectory space. You can take all possible trajectory in the system, put a probability, and show that everything works. So, this is a is, is standard for jump process. Also, if from most of the things, the, the, most, the more difficulty of this respect to the standard Katz model, that thanks to the independence of the, of the collision rate on the velocity, in the Katz model, the, the collision rate is independent of the state. So it's essentially this, when you see it as a stochastic process, it's skew product. The collision process go on underneath and the collision happen on top. This is no more like this because the, 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 the collision rate depends on the number of particles in the system and actually are unbounded. 
in, uh, so that makes things a little more complex. But it's easy to say the steady state is given by the grand canonical distribution, where you have a Poissonian time a Maxwellian in the right number of uh, uh, coordinate. So, <clears throat> and if you interpret this as a grand canonical distribution, you immediately read out that the chemical potential is the one I wrote before uh, at, the, at the beginning. And so the, again, this is a grand canonical ensemble with temperature one or two pi, chemical potential, <clears throat> that's, that's number, and the average number of particles is new over rho. And so to follow the idea of the grand Boltzmann limit, we fix the, you remember the, the lambda tilde was the coefficient in front of the CATS operator. And the scaling is to say that we take it to be essentially uh, one over the average number of particles, two over the average number of particles. Essentially what we had in the standard CATS model where the number of particles was fixed. And again, this is not a self-adjoint operator L on, on L2, on that huge L2. So you can transform it in self-adjoint exactly as before. And on these, on these uh, large L2 space, you can add the scalar product exactly as before. On every, on every slice, you put the, the scalar product given by the Maxwellian and with its weight. And, and then you can rewrite your evolution on this, on this uh, new space in this form. And if you, the interesting thing is if you look at P plus and P minus, they have a very familiar form. This is one thing I like of this system because they are Fox space creation and annihilation operation. And ascension. So if you wanna, if you look at them, what you can prove now that, that, that by this is that L is self-adjoint and non-positive definite as <clears throat> unique steady states. And the, the spectral gap is minus rho. And these are the, the, the eigenstate related to the spectral gap. And the way to do it is just to, the self-adjointness is almost evident. And also the, the non-positivity. Uh, non and so you immediately get the, the, the evolution toward the, the, the steady state. But the interesting thing is that if you modify a little the, the, your operator, because in a sense, the P plus and P minus are a creation and annihilation of particles respect to the state with no particle. If you want to have creation and annihilation respect to the equilibrium, you have to do kind of quasi particle operator to speak in field theory language, and you get exactly the commutation relation of a field theory. And from now on, building a, a the uh, uh, orthonormal base for the thermostat evolution is just uh, essentially you take the, the any base, not the natural one to consider is the Hermit polynomial, and you consider the Fox space created on the Hermit polynomial and the occupation number, and you find immediately that these are uh, these are a base, an orthonormal base for the evolution given by the thermostat. And the last thing you are left to check is that. The, the, the collision don't give you trouble, but in the space, in the minimum eigenspace for the, for the thermostat, there are two states that are null state for the collision because they are rotational invariant. And so those two are exactly the one that are the gap eigenstate. And, and that could close the, the, the business of finding the, the gap and the evolution of this guy. And then you can check for the second eigen, second gap, that is essentially interestingly enough for the number of particle large is telling you that the thermostat and the evolution are essentially independent. And because rho is the gap from one, lambda over two is the gap from the other. And you see they are essentially in there. And this is just based on expressing the, the, the collision operator in terms of the creation and mutilation operator. It's boring and long computation, but you do it and then you can get all what you need. Okay, so this was, and then the other things you would like to check is convergence in entropy. 
Now, this is also a little messy because again, these are, you have all this infinite sum and business. The relative entropy is again given by the, the sum of the entropy, relative entropy on each slice averaged with the weight of the slide. And, but you can prove again that the, the derivative of the entropy is, uh, is negative and is strictly bounded by the entropy itself. And uh, the, the, uh, as before, all, meaning all what I said before for L2, you have to deal with the fact that everything is unbounded. So I, I get with it for easy that you can prove self-adjoint. You have to prove it that it's self-adjoint as not only symmetric, and, but, and also here, for example, you can take the derivative. Actually, this derivative is not trivial to take. You have to exchange the derivative with the integral and the sum, but you can show that you can, again, you can forget the, the, the collision, the, the collision term and just look at the entry produced by the interaction with the thermostat. And, and they said you can define your entropy S, psi is your entropy production, and E is just the integral of the function. Then I want to give a statement that does not require the, the state to be normalized. And what you get is that the, the, you have a general inequality for this three quantity. Hn is a family of function. An are my number. And for any general family of this function, Hn of V, and this definition of entropy and entropy production, you have this inequality. That is the base of, from, from which immediately follow that the entropy go down exponentially. And now the, the, the proof of this uh, inequality is uh, it's, uh, based on a coarse graining argument and after which at least the, 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 the way I find this, the way of proving it is by looking at gross proof of the log Sobolev inequality and reducing the whole thing to a property of a binomial distribution and using convexity over, over and over again to go down to a, and uh, I, since there is also a relation with field theory, I think there should be some, uh, there should be some closer relation with uh, some log Sobolev, but I, I don't know, I, I haven't had time to look at it. The first thing you do, you want a coarse grain the space and so divide it in cell. This is not trivial because you want to coarse grain every Rn based on the same grid. I mean, I want to divide R in finite interval, construct the grid on every Rn and show that there is a fine enough grid such that I can approximate as well as I want the entropy of my system by a coarse grain and keeping into account that I have to go up to infinity. And, but this is a little, boring uh, measure theory, and I think you can do it. And, and once you have that, the, you do the same thing as before, and uh, now you have your coarse grain. But if you have a coarse grain, you essentially have looking at function that are constant over interval, over, over square or cube. So the first thing you think is that, okay, these integrals should become sum. And indeed you do exactly what you think you do. You introduce, yeah, this is, to say that you can approximate. And then you introduce occupation number. You say how many particles are in each of, the, of my interval. And you can rewrite everything in terms of uh, your occupation numbers for the evolution. And now you get that your, your entropy and your entropy production are given just by sum over Poissonian distribution. Yeah, the pi are again Poissonian distribution. And now the, the whole thing is to prove an inequality between Poissonian, this kind of Poissonian entropy. And you can think that this now that's having a finite number of kind of particles that enter a leader system with given rates. And now, okay, this is just, again, convexity, you reduce to the case of only one. Convexity, again, you reduce yourself to the case of a binomial, of a binomial distribution and then the things come out uh, pretty straightforward. Okay, so this is the, the, the result, just the last 15 minutes or less. Let me just speak a moment of 
the, the main interest of Mark Katz for this problem was the, the, the Boltzmann Katz equation. The idea is that the, uh, let's go back to the original system. And this is the, 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 my Boltzmann Katz, my Katz model at the beginning. And, <clears throat> and observe that the, the, the RIJ preserved clearly the, the integral. And now suppose that at least in some approximation, approximate form, for every T we have that the state is a product. And this is a strong form of the Stossel ansatz, the molecular Katz hypothesis. It actually, I think, is Maxwell the first one that writes it down. And then Boltzmann uses. And uh, then you will get the validity of a Boltzmann Katz equation of this form. This will come directly just simply by integrating both sides of the equation and assuming that the things above all. And clearly, even, even uh, F0, F at time zero is a product. In general, F at time two is not a product because they interact. So Mark Katz introduced what he called the, the Boltzmann property. And nowadays it's called the, the chaotic uh, property or a chaotic sequence. As a sequence of distribution is chaotic. If, if I take the marginal over a finite number of particles and then let the number of particles goes to infinity, but keep the margin, the number of which I take the margin finite, these become a product. This is an extremely nice, it's very smart way to say that, okay, they are not really uh, a product, but kind of. For, and keep in mind that from the, 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 the things that physicists always tell you is that there is no physic, interest in physical quantity that depends on more than the three point correlation function. You never see in a physical application. I think three, someone told me that depending. Two is the speed of sound, for example. But so you normally are interested in very low K, K one, two, three are what you care for. And so you define this is a chaotic sequence. And the classical example is the uniform distribution on a sphere. The uniform distribution in a sphere of radius square root of M, if you project it on K variable and let M goes to infinity, you get the Maxwellian distribution on RK. Okay, so this is, you get actually this uh, distribution. Oh, so that's wrong, the, 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 what, the clock. Okay, the, the, you get actually the proof of this. And you can also show that this equation actually makes sense and converge to equilibrium exponentially and a lot of nice things. And okay, I had an idea of the proof is just based on a power series expansion. And on the idea that if you apply my, the operator on a, on a function that uh, depend only on a finite number of variables, meaning you define in weak form the, the marginal, then most of the term in the Katz operator drop out. And so you get a very simple uh, expression and it's with the, 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 the proof is due to Katz, but it's McKean that gives this very nice algebraic uh, definition. And, and then you, <clears throat> you can do it also for the system with the Maxwellian thermostat. When you go to the system with the, the grand canonical, then things get more complex because the number of particle changes. So, the density is not, is the density of particle that is the interesting things for your cat, not the probability in itself. So it's not easy how to define, but you define a product state as something like this, as the uh, Poissonian state. You can define the density and the, and the chaotic property in a little more complex way by looking at all possible end particle structure. And, <clears throat> And, and then you take the limit when the number of particles, the mu goes to infinity. And with all these, you again get a boltzmann katz equation with a convergence in the number of particles plus the usual term you had before. And the, 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 I'm not gonna own the proof that the messy of the proof is that, the proof is nice because I like it because it's messed up because the Katz proof is based on the power series expansion. But here everything is unbounded. So power series expansion, you cannot do it. 
So the whole thing is that you want to expand the minimum necessary to exploit CATS cancellation, but not more than nothing converge anymore. And you can do it. It's, it's a little messed up, but it come out. And then just two minutes for Outlook. Now that I have thermostat and I understand them pretty well, what I would like to do is to say, okay, I take two thermostats with a system in the middle, but why only one system? I wanna take something like this. I have one thermostat on one side, one thermostat on the other side, and then a series of what I call cats boxes with the idea that particle in each box collide with the particle in the same box and with the two names. And maybe they can also jump. And these can be done in three dimension. Most of the things is just a question of notation to go in three dimension. So in three, see, if you are in three dimension, the thermostat, you can also think that they give a drift in different direction. So you can create a shear in the, in the system. You can create a flow of particle by putting different chemical potential. You can do a lot of things. The funny things of the CATS model is that the macroscopic equation are trivial. It's just a simple computation to show that already on this system in one dimension, you have Fourier law that holds without any effort. Where I'm cheating, T here is the average kinetic energy. Temperature should be the exponent of the Maxwellian, not the average kinetic energy from uh, uh, my statistical mechanical point of view. But for the kinetic energy, you have the Fourier law come out without it is just a simple computation. And all, if you use a three-dimensional with all the other uh, moon equilibrium, you get macroscopic load that are kind of hydrodynamics. And they come out essentially as an exercise in, in computation. So the question is, what is the equilibrium distribution, the macroscopic equilibrium distribution underneath? Now I know how the temperature, this average kinetic energy evolved. Is there a, a local equilibrium structure evolving underneath? How are the current related? Are there local Boltzmann Katz equation coupled that describe the system? And this is what I would like to, to see and to do. And this is just the list of people that collaborated, uh, in particular, Justin Beck, that now is a PhD in Notre Dame, is the one which, which I did this grand canonical uh, system. And this is some publication if anybody is interested to look more. And thank you. Uh, you didn't use uh, relative entropy or things like that. Uh, were in the in the last part of your talk. I in mean, the, the, yes, the the the, the, the is the relative entropy that I look for the convergence to equilibrium relative entropy for the grand canonical system. Uh, I was meaning uh, about the the cats uh, uh, proof of. You, you were looking at, at the equations, but uh, and then you were solving them uh, by brute force, I think, no? Which equation? For, for, for which system? Uh, the, the, yeah. the system with the reser the, uh, particle reservoir? Yeah. We well, the, in, in the, the, for, for checking the gap in L2, we essentially solved the equation by brute force, by diagonalizing the dynamics. In the entropy, instead, it's just a, a kind of uh, log sobel of inequality that I'm using. But I'm not trying to solve the equation at all. I'm just trying to show that the, the, the derivative and the entropy divided by the entropy is bounded by something. There is a function, it's really an a, a inequality between entropies of two process, of a process that, that I'm looking at. And I, I actually have no idea of solutions to it. I'm not trying to solve the, but just to, and the main trick is just convexity. It's just using convexity of entropy to, and to reduce it, style the, 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 the gross proof that to a, essentially you are, rep, I'm representing my system as a huge uh, bath of uh, by norm, uh, Bernoulli distribution. And then showing that I can reduce to only one by convexity. There is also a question online. Uh, ah. Maybe we can just go for Matteo, Colangeli, and then. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the very inspiring talk. 
I would like to ask a um, small uh, general question. So, <clears throat> um, I understand that the, 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 the model that you present, the stochastic cuts model, I mean, somehow retains few of the um, properties of the underlying deterministic dynamics that you simulated at the beginning of your talk. So, my, my question is whether um, a, a variant of the Katz model that you presented is also amenable to somehow to implement also uh, some uh, um, attractive interaction between the particles because then this may give rise to phase transition. Thank you. So you 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 want to bias the evolution to simulate an attraction between the particle. Precisely. There are this, this simulation, but I don't know much, in which you, you add on top the fact that the particle can stick together. I don't know if that is a form of, a, that is a form of attraction, a little dramatic attraction, but, but the, I can answer with a non-answer, so that is a very interesting question. I never thought myself about it, so I don't know exactly what to say, but it would be very interesting to look into it. Yes, so I, I just had the question about your your last model that you want to study. You know? Why mm -hmm. you put a lot of CAD system? In my opinion, it's difficult. To, only one with two reservoirs. Yeah, so, so because I had only five <laughs> minutes to talk. So. Okay. <laughs> so what we are actually trying to do with Michael is, is actually the two thermostat and the reservoir in the middle. I'm not so convinced that is that much. Uh, simpler because if you take out the reservoir you just the problem is that you, you can think of your particle colliding with a colliding tree that in the case of the cats model you have all all possible uh, it's a full tree between the, the, the particle and here you just pruned it in such a way that they only collide in, in subgroup but an an extra that in my opinion is if, if the number of collision you have is enough to generate the full rotation group you can get essentially most of the results. But this is, on the other side, if you have two thermostat on the same one, particle interact with both, that, that's a lot of uh, problem. Because one, you know, you have two force that pull the same particle on two different sides. And I, 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 I'm, intuitively you're right, but I'm not so sure that it's simple. Well, yeah. This is my opinion. I haven't done it, so I cannot say anything. But I think that one, meaning what we would be trying to do with uh, Michael, and we have some preliminary result, is to take really the situation. Because if you have only one and two, you can show that there is a unique steady state. You can show convergence. In the, in the T2 metric is done by Lebowitz and Muho, I think. So the idea is to see, the curiosity is to see, to take two reservoir and two large system with a small one in the middle. And the idea is that you want to see two time scale on it. You have one time scale where they behave like thermostat and one time scale where they just, they just go to equilibrium. Yeah, because at some point if they are fine. So these, but it's, it, it, it ain't easy. I mean, the, the fact that you have these two things that they almost interact through this small channel make things, at least to me, messy. But, since I have no explicit result up to now, I cannot really say, but. Hi, um, so I had a question about the, the grad Boltzmann uh, limit for the, the mean free time that you discussed kind of at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, is this just like a formal approach to set up the, the model in general, or are there rigorous results for how these, these limits work? Okay, so the, the... There are rigorous results, meaning it's the only that if the, the let me if you take the realistic Boltzmann problem, you have a box with n particle, and that they have a radius, they collide, they start with a distribution that is chaotic or decoupled. The 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 only known things that is uh, well, I, I will qualify in a moment, but the main theorem is the Lamford theorem that tells you that the Boltzmann equation holds for, I think, the world is zero three of the mean free time. 
or zero two, something, something like that. For a time that is very short, you have the Boltzmann equation. And the result is in the grad Boltzmann limit. So that's in that sense, the limit is the rigorous background, is how the Boltzmann equation is understood in, uh, in, in, uh, in rigorously, but also in physics, because if that is not true, then you go to non-dilute, dilute, you have uh, Chapman, Chapman Hanscom, you have a lot of other uh, stuff. But that's, and I think the best result available are the one of uh, uh, San Raymond and Gallagher that they get 0 0.9 of the free time, or almost the full. But so the, you, the, the only proof of the Boltzmann equation, rigorous proof, are based on the Boltzmann. Graph. So it's, it's rigorous in that sense. There are theorems based on that. And in my view, is, is, is the natural way to fix. The important, the, the relevant things that is very different from the standard thermodynamic limit you may learn in statistical mechanics. The box stayed fixed and the number of particles increased, the radius became smaller while actually there is a rescaling to map one in the other. But this is the way that is normally understood. And yes, there are rigorous results based on, uh, on this, uh, this set. Actually, there is uh, the, 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 the only one of the few results on the Boltzmann equation uniform in time is Malchior of Viventi Milner, that they can show that the Boltzmann equation hold in the Grad Boltzmann limit uniform in time for an expanding gas. Actually, the particles don't collide anymore because they expand. And those are my knowledge about the result and the rigorous implementation of the Grad Boltzmann. Thank you. <clears throat> if, not, then, or if not, then let's uh, some some questions online. I should ask. No. Let's see. No, it doesn't seem. Okay, then let's. There's something in the chat. I don't know if this is a question, but this is probably from before. Yeah, there was only Maritza Sarva saying hello. Okay, good. So. Then uh, let us uh, thank uh, Federico again. <laughs>